Hello everyone, Sunny here, Chris Hey, how you going? With me, and this is episode 4 of Zeitgeist Melbourne Radio Now the way things work with Spreaker is uh, it We have to start the radio show in order to be able to share it So while we're getting all that set up We want you to listen to some of the topics we'll be talking about in the news As told in this satirical clip You're gonna love it just said, why don't you, for once in your life, just do the fucking news? All right, no, 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 I'm going to do, no, I'm going to do the fucking news, no. Here is the fucking news. Ex-commercial TV PR man, old Etonian and occasional big fucker David Cameron would like to bomb Syria. Unfortunately, Russia's got there first and America's been doing it for ages. He wants to bomb Syria to stop the flow of refugees fleeing all the bombs. He's also hoping it will stop the increased influence of Islamic extremism. Bombing Syria would, of course, destroy the one remaining multicultural society in the region, leaving it open to the increased influence of Islamic extremism. To bomb Syria, therefore, is clearly mental. In other news, no, 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 I'm doing, no, I'm doing the news. I'm doing the fucking news. In other news, in other news, Muslims are bad, China's bad, but not as bad as it used to be, and Russia is always bad. Nuclear weapons are good, and to suggest not using nuclear weapons is bad. Onto the economy. Debt is good. Corrupt banks are bad, but not bad enough for us to do anything about them. And poverty in the UK is a figment of your imagination. On to housing, Jeremy Corbyn's plans to build affordable housing and create social housing for the poorest people in our society is a terrible idea. That's according to multi-millionaire, property magnet, and all-round shitpot Sir Alan Sugar. Environmental news, there's nothing to worry about, so please carry on consuming at your usual rate. And finally tonight, entertain. Damon's intelligent and articulate observations about sexuality in Hollywood means that he is definitely a homophobic twat. My name is Jonathan Pye, and that was the fucking news! Oh, there we are. So, Chris... Well, that was the fucking news, mate. That was <laughs> what can I say? News. We'll just expand on all those topics he just touched on there, I reckon. <laughs> yeah, look, um, may I just sort of like give you a, a pre-shadowing? Neither of us is a geopolitical expert or a former ambassador to any nation, nor have we written books on the subject or anything like that, but it, we're both, you know, from a, a unique perspective in Melbourne following these topics... And we would rant, be ranting about this in person over coffee. And since the Guys Melbourne show needs to be done, we figured let's not know. let's just drink coffee and rant about it on the radio. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, for me personally, where you know a lot of what's going down in Syria comes from, and um, it comes from the event. I lived in Libya for nine years uh, between two thousand two and nineteen ninety three. Uh, basically, there was a war in Bosnia, which was initiated by America, as we later found America! out. America! <laughs> in the standard American way, um, eventually they bombed people, mm -hmm. and they bombed the bad people. But initially, they just gave money to every extremist. They were like, you guys out here, we don't really like your country, so we're going to find nutters, and whoever is the nuttiest is going to get the weapons. And, you know, Muslim extremists, Serbian extremists, Croat extremists... People that have committed genocide during Second World War and First World War all got American funding and weapon in this quest for democracy because the socialist system that we had prior to that... Oh, you can't have socialism. We can't have that. No. That, that was the true terrorists. Yeah, that's right. Socialism is a terrorist. So, somehow the guys that fought off the Nazis in the Second World War and established the government that was generally popular, they were the terrorists, but the people that fought with the Nazis, now they were the freedom. Nonetheless. So, the reasoning of how I ended up in Libya was thanks to U.S. Endowment for Democracy and U.S. Foreign Policy. And that's how Fantastic. I ended up in Libya. And then, uh, then they bombed Libya, certainly. So then what happened? So it was, Libya was a really nice country. It was really nice. Uh, the infrastructure was amazing. There was no such thing as poverty. Um, you know, there was a, 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 a... Again, it was a dictatorship. This, sound, this sounds like all propaganda and lies, because I heard Gaddafi was a pretty, uh, pretty a real bastard. According to uh, mainstream media, well, look, uh, didn't they give away free bread in an apartment for young people? Isn't that yeah, what they they, there? look, education was free, scholarship overseas were free, infrastructure was amazing. You'd get interest-free loans upon marriage. Interest-free? Well, that's capitalism gone backwards. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so I'm sure he was pretty bad to a very narrow list of people he considered enemies. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he was okay with beheading them. <laughs> 
But I mean, if you're leading a country and you're bad to where it's 10,000 people and you're good <laughs> to four and a half million, you know, you got to take that into context. Mm-hmm. Now we're getting, we're getting some likes and comments. Oh, how lovely. Um, <laughs> but going back to Libya. So I moved out of Libya in a while. Uh, Did you kept... take your interest free loan with you? <laughs> I was a foreigner. Okay. Honestly, when I moved out of Libya, if somebody's told me you can have a Libyan passport or the American or the Australian or the German or the Swiss, mm. I would have taken the Libyan one. It came with more freebies. To be a citizen of Libya came with more freebies than any country I was aware of. So then America bombed Libya. So then where'd you go? Did you go to Baghdad after that? Well, was that, was no, that I was in it? Australia oh, okay. when America bombed Libya. Oh, okay. and, but my mom was in Libya. My dad was in Germany. At, like my dad was in Libya when they bombed Bosnia he was in Germany when they bombed Libya so my dad somehow always escapes from all these wars and yeah, my mom very good my mom always gets stuck in the bombed country oh well that's probably what I do with my missus <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even mention that I was in Iraq before they bombed Iraq oh there you go there you go nonetheless Beautiful. you're picking the right countries nonetheless you know it was I had friends that were there, guys that I went to high school with, and initially they were telling me, Oi, Sonny, you know, we've got fucking crazies uh, from e- Egypt, like they're crazy Muslim extremists, the worst of the worst coming here trying to kill us. Next thing they're going, we are for the rebels, because like they were genuinely afraid that these people are going to take over and start executing whoever said some bad things on Facebook, and it was, uh... and my mom got out of the airport, but I'm more or less... Uh, uh, realized that the the story that was being told about Gaddafi was completely false. Of course. The story that was being told about the opposition was completely false. And the way that Libya went down, the way that the Gaddafi government regime, if you want to use that term, it's not exactly inaccurate for Libya. Mm. The way the regime went down was that um, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Emirates, uh, with, of course, the backing of United States and NATO, found the craziest elements within Libya, and but mostly foreign fighters within Egypt and mm-hmm. um, other Arab countries. Well, there was a lot of Chechens over there too, wasn't there? Yeah. Basically, any Muslim that's generally against secular governments, which mm-hmm. Libya was one... There's a few down there from Indonesia too. They don't like uh, secular yeah. governments. They wanted, you know, the Sharia law, the... I don't know. The, 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 and they all got mobilized to overthrow Gaddafi. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, the state of Libya is ten times worse. Mm-hmm. And these people, after Gaddafi was overthrown, had to go somewhere. You know, once you start assembling... Well, they were pretty much... We, we found out that they were pretty much put on a transporter plane, American, and flown straight over to uh, Syria. Yep. And this is kind of where the, where the story um, continues. Because I was sort of tuned into what's going on in Libya. Next thing you know, the next regime dictator, again, democratically elected... To a large extent, the most legitimate person to rule uh, uh, the Syria at the moment. Mm-hmm. It's not like there is a popular democratic movement behind one specific party or a group of people that you know a majority of people in Syria support. Like Assad has got more legitimacy to govern that country than anybody else, and he has a track record of uh, you know a largely peaceful, secular, multi-ethnic, multicultural. Multi-religious. There's plenty of Christians well, in Syria you, that were doing well, well, quite if you, well. Thank if you, you wanted to talk about a country that beheads people and chops people's hands off and do all that, I don't think you could look any further than uh, Saudi Arabia. I mean, if you want to, if you want to talk about dictators and uh, people that have no human rights, well, uh, and, and things, and you know, we in Australia, our leaders, the US leaders, they back the bid to get. Saudi Arabia to chair the UN Human Rights Council. I know, it's just disgusting. I mean, that's it's just so backward, it's not funny. <laughs> it's ridiculous. These people don't even know what human rights are, but they just put their hand up for it. That's like asking Israel to look at the human rights in Palestine. But I mean, you know, like, you got to think, though. Uh, I mean, if when somebody brings up the idea, right, it, it's like, hey, uh, we got to... I have an idea, Chris. We're doing the Manhattan Project for Solar Cells and we want a visionary, visionary leader and, and George Bush, what do you reckon? George Bush? Oh, well, he's, a, he's a real smarty, that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's like, it's so ridiculous you couldn't imagine I it. Watched like... him, I watched him when the towers come down reading a book to school kids and he had the, it was, uh, uh, I don't know, Jenny, something to do with Jenny and the goat 
you know, it was like a two-year-old children's book, and he actually had it upside down. So you know, he's really he's so on fucking the, smart. He he's on the upside, ball. He can read. He can read upside down. <laughs> children's book. It's amazing. I'm fucking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway. But I mean, no, it, it, it's it's kind of what what you're looking at is a surreal thing, and I wanted to like just show some of the reporting. So, um, what's been evident from the reports on the ground in Syria? What's been evident from the fact that there was hundreds of millions of dollars of funding going to Syrian rebels, and there was no distinction between Syrian rebels and Al Qaeda? It's been uh, um, the fact that these crazies were being trained in Turkey, were making their way through Turkey uh, into uh, Syria. Well, the border's uh, open between Turkey and Syria, and we, and they know that, that uh, look, even even the Al-Qaeda, ISIS, whatever you want to call mm-hmm. them, they have an embassy in Turkey where mm-hmm. they, where they where, where, so when you fly into Turkey and you want to, you know, you want to fight the, uh, you know, for God and whatever, yeah. you know, um, you've got to go through them and they've got to check your passport, know who you are, and, they, and then they get you across the border and with an AK-47 and point you in the general direction of uh, <laughs> the infidels and away you go. I mean, this is pretty much it. So Turkey Turkey is, uh, is, is, is one of the biggest lies out there because they have an open border. They're shipping in guns, medical supplies, food. You've got to remember, I was in the army a long time ago and there's one thing I know about the army that I don't think the general public are quite aware of. These people who are fighting, I mean, it would probably take me half an hour to teach you how to use an AK-47, right? Yeah. They're pretty straight, you know, bullets in here, point it in this direction, not at your head. You know, it's pretty straightforward. But some of the equipment that they use today, these goat herders, because that's what they are. You know, a lot of them are goat herders. They can barely count how many goats they got, <laughs> let alone do anything else. You can't even drive a military vehicle unless you're trained to do it. Yeah. Because it's not like a normal car. You, and remember, if they're a goat herder, they've probably never driven a bloody car. So, you know, it, it, you have to be trained in all as, uh, facets of, of the army. Mm-hmm. You know, all this equipment that gets sent over, it has to come with training. So who's training these people? That's number one. We've well, got we know, camps in Turkey. And well, been... we got camps in Turkey. They well, had camps in... Um, camps in Syria as well. In Jordan, yeah. too. And, and, and what we found out is that we got oil being shipped out of Syria mm. by the sun of the Turkish Prime Minister. Funny that. Mm, Every boy. day the trucks are leaving leaving Syria full of oil. And then you think to yourself, well, all right. So if you want to kill any army, all you got to do is you got to cut down on their logistics. you got to shut shut their logistics down. So you got a 67-kilometre border on, the, on, on Turkish and Syria, which is open, backwards, forwards. Now, when all these uh, uh, so-called uh, Al-Qaeda, ISIL... Uh, moderates, whatever you want to call them, when they get injured in battle, where do they go? Well, there's a hospital in Turkey which is run by the daughter of the Turkish Prime Minister. Oh, She's the manager. It's a family business. Oh, yeah, and, and, and they, of course, they patch these uh, these guys up, you know, a couple of band-aids, whatever. And then the ones that are seriously injured, they get flown straight over to Israel. Did you know that, Sonny? Wow. Uh, you know, like... <laughs> so who's supporting these uh, al- this Al-Qaeda? And one of the other funny things is the other day is I heard a general, I can't remember his name. I'm not jumping ahead here because I'm talking about a different person that we, we spoke about yeah, earlier. Yeah. This general turned around and said, we should be looking at helping Al-Qaeda, funding Al-Qaeda to overthrow the Syrian government. Now, I think, I can't remember, this is a long time ago, but wasn't it Al-Qaeda that bombed the Twin Towers? In America? Oh, but wait a minute, wait a minute. Though. But wait a minute. So there's there's 3,000 families out there in America who are doing absolutely nothing because I'd be in the street if it was my family. Yeah. And I know one of the families because they had a, 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 a brother who was a firefighter who died in the Twin Towers. And you've got this general coming out and saying, we need to team up with um, Al-Qaeda now to overthrow the Syrian government. So they were our enemy for 10 years. Now they're our friends and we should support them. Where is the riding in the streets? Are people so brain dead over there in the US that they can't get out there with a bloody placard and tell the tell yeah. their federal government enough's enough? Well, look, it, it's a strange question. It, it, it almost the very question you just asked sets us up with a completely wrong paradigm. We, it, they're not saying we should support Al Qaeda. They're they've been supporting Al Qaeda in Syria. Yeah, but they're from coming the out. Go. Yeah, but we're com- coming out with like these semi confusing statements. No, 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 no. This is blatant. You can look this up. And even you got Senator John McCain, right? 
This guy should be hung up. He's hung. been pictured. He's he been should pictured. be hung for treason. Because now he's saying, we need to give the uh, these... Uh, Syrian rebels. Syrian rebels, Al-Qaeda, whoever, Al-Nusra. We should be giving them the Mampat, you know, the Stinger missiles, take out the jets, the helicopters. We need to arm these people up. Mm. This guy should be dragged by, what, by his feet all the way into one of the courts in the US and thrown his ass in jail. For treason, because that's exactly what he's doing. It, look, it's comical. The guy was meeting with. Um, Thank God they never voted him as the, as the, the president of the United meeting, States. The guy was meeting serial rebels. Uh, if you look at the pictures, people have like identified who's in the photos. Al Baghdadi, like, basically, basically Al Qaeda. Oh yeah, he's there arranging for U.S. to fund those guys. Now, what I want to what I want to sort of read a couple of uh, snippets is the U.S. There's a ton of contradictory information coming in from the U.S. government because they're scrambling. How do they spin the story? They've already admitted they can't to, spin it. They've they've lost it now. They've lost control. They've now the Russians are in there and yeah. they're wiping out Al Qaeda. There actually three thousand ISIS fighters just mm-hmm. ran over the border of Jordan. Yep. So, it, so it, I mean, it's a scramble. There's a story about a guy called uh, Anas Ibrahim Abaid or Abu Zaid, commander from the U.S. backed Division Thirty. And, like, they sent this guy in with 70 soldiers, special ops, to fight Assad. Of course he's going to fight Assad, but within hours of going into the country, he joins al-Nusra. Like, based that... No, how did that happen? Oh, <laughs> this is how they select these people. I mean, you've got... Um, yeah, two days after the latest contingent of U.S. trade, uh, uh, this is from the Daily Beast. Uh, of Two days after the latest contingent of U.S. trained forces in Syria, a commander, Anas Ibrahim Abed, known as Abu Zaid, linked up with them, brackets al-Nusra, handed over U.S. supplied equipment mm. to Jabhat al-Nusra, the official al-Qaeda franchise in Syria. The U.S. Yeah, military... Franchise. Yeah, they're a franchise. Well, I knew it's this... Like the McDonald's... I always they're, thought they're, they're... there was money in franchises, Sonny, and I'll tell you why. Because when General Austin... This yeah. is an American General Austin was asked how many Al Qaeda, oh, sorry, how many uh, Syrian rebels? Yeah, we've uh, got a quote right here. Only four or five. This is from Reuters. General Austin, only a handful U.S. trained Syrian rebels still fighting. That's five, everybody. Only four or five. <laughs> four or five are still fighting for the U.S. These uh, so-called uh, moderates, and uh, it cost them. Um, 500 million? Yeah. Now there's a job. I would even, I would convert to Islam tomorrow, live in a cave for a year and get my 100 million and split it with my mates. <laughs> no, 500 and split it with my mates. That's, that is legendary. I mean, like, this is, uh, this is Rambo. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every one of them is going to have, <laughs> what? Like, every one of them gets a plane? Well, you know what? A helicopter? Yeah, but look, I've got to give it... Gun? I've got to give it to this, this General Austin in the US. He was he was put up in front of a committee, and he blatantly just... He told the truth. I mean, I don't know whether he was supposed to tell the truth, but he went, yeah, I just look at him in my... Pa- yeah, five, we've trained. And you guess who's sitting on the board at this, uh, this uh, open hearing? McCain. Oh. <laughs> he must have been sitting there cringing yeah. when this uh, Austin told the truth that day. I mean, think... And then we got a picture here on Reuters, and you look at everyone's just staring at this poor bastard. You got to feel for him. <laughs> you got to oh, feel for him. Oh lord! <laughs> but um, oh, and I mean, there, there's pictures here of, of dudes that look like yeah, goat herders with like equipment that looks so space age. I reckon like those things would launch into outer space if you oh, yeah. line them up right. And um, so basically, what you have is a. a a propaganda war going on which is as important as the real war. Of course. Now, the trouble for the Americans is that, you know, in this version, in, in this reality, the truth is antithetical to their interests. I mean, there is no way, you know, you go in for whatever reasons you have to get rid of a political leader. Back in the day when empires didn't pretend to be democracies... They would just openly fund the opposition or bomb him or assassinate him or whatever and get rid of him. Today, getting rid of Assad requires first convincing the public that A, Assad's a bad person, that B, the opposition are good guys, 
Yeah, well, they can't convince anyone of these got weapons of mass destruction because they've already used that. They've already that tried old, to. Get, old, uh, they've, they've already tried to accuse him of using chemical weapons, and it came out basically that the rebels were the ones using chemical weapons, and they were so fucking retarded they mostly used it on themselves. And they also <laughs> filmed themselves doing it, you know, like selfies. That's big now. Big now, filming yourself doing stupid shit. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and the Russians, of course. Um, Realized that they could help, that, that they could use, uh, again, public opinion to help their ally, Assad. Well, the Russians, Russians are playing chess. And when, when, uh, when Putin got up at the UN and he said, we've had enough. We're, the Russian people and the Russian government are sick to the stomach of what they're seeing happening over, happening over mm. there and the propaganda that used behind it to overthrow mm. a person a, an, a, an elected government, and you know yeah. Assad, and they, they said we're sick to our, sick to our stomach to watch what's happening. That every country America's gone into, well, every country where America wants to be is where Al Qaeda is. So, you know, if Al Qaeda's there, America's there, and we've just heard, I think, last week that Al Qaeda is now in South Africa. I got no idea why, but I'm going to take, I'm going to draw a long bow and say, might have something to do with them joining up with the BRICS Bank. And their uh, prime minister down there, or president, I can't remember. I can't even remember his name. But he's been talking up the BRICS Bank something terrible. So I don't think it's in America's interest for anyone, any nation, to be draw- joining the BRICS banking system. So so we've got Al-Qaeda there. And then we've also got Senator McCain, that, uh, that warmongering parasite. He's now talking about supplying weapons and equipment to the Chechens. To get something revved up over there, just to give uh, Russia another distraction, as well as the Ukraine. Oh. So we're watching what's happening, and it's 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 just disgusting. I mean, I'm not a I'm not a flag waver for Putin, but uh, I just read uh, yesterday that he bombed they bombed 29 bases in 24 hours. Mm. So I think the way I see it, if they get the uh, ISIS on the run, it'll only be a matter of months before they've clean they've done the cleanup and they're all gone. But now we've got. Afghanistan government and the Iraqi government saying, well, wait a minute, we've had America in here for years and years and years. And they've been using this Al-Qaeda, ISIS as a threat to these governments. You know, you don't do what you're told. Al-Qaeda will come and get you or, or, uh, you know, uh, they'll they'll come and overthrow the government or bomb you or take you out. Mm. And now they've seen what Russia's doing and and they've been inviting Russia and Russia's contemplating setting up bases in those other countries and, and, and follow through. Iraq, yeah, Iraq, I think it was Iraqi foreign minister simply said, look, you know, um, we have an ISIS problem. Russia seems to be really helping Syrians out. We'd pest like... control. We have a pest problem and they're bringing the pest controllers. Um, <laughs> and I mean, it, it, the, the insanity, you know, if we look for the deeper reasons why, uh, how and why all these things are happening. I mean, you have to, you have to, look at the petrodollar as sort of the central uh, um, issue in, in, in these conflicts because what you have is I understand what you're saying but I think it's I think the way I see it is you're watching Russia with a lot of oil and gas mm. and what they're doing is they're spreading pipelines into Europe right yeah. all Russian oil and gas pipelines through through Ukraine, pipelines through Turkey, pipelines to Greece, gas hubs in Greece, gas hubs in Turkey, right? Now, this this energy that they're going to transport there, gas, oil, whatever it may be, this is this is a game changer. I mean, you've got America and American infrastructure falling on their sword. You've got Russia and China going around the world making deals, not only making deals with other countries like U.S. oligarchs and U.S. companies used to do, unlike in the past, you got China building up the infrastructure in these countries. So they're not just coming in there and exploiting and taking everything out of the country. They're building roads. They're building schools. They're building hospitals. They're building everything. And same as Russia, making these deals where, where France, England, and America never did, or yeah. Germany. They used to just take, take whatever. They built a road, all right, only to get the bloody oil out of the ground or the yeah. ore out of the ground to yeah. get it out of there. They built so, ports, generally. So, so you're watching, <laughs> like an octopus, you're watching the legs of, of Russia, oil and gas stretch out all over Europe, and America doesn't like it. And it's very telling because we had a um, we had an, an American diplomat in Greece, and it was in an interview. 
he was saying that uh, he wanted uh, America, uh, he wanted um, the uh, American gas company to build a pipeline and, and a hub in Greece. So he built this. Uh, he was talking about we need to build this hub in Greece, and Greece said, "Yeah, you know, we're we're broke. Well, you know, we've got a gas, we've got a Russian gas hub here. We're going to have an American gas hub here. Competition. It's all good." And he straight away turned around and said, "Oh no!" In front of the camera, "No, you can't have the Russian one. It's either us or it's nothing." That's pretty much it. They don't like competition, and they don't like the idea that that Russia is going to um, export their oil and gas. And this is all about oil, and it's all about money, and it's all about control. And America is losing the control. They're overstretched. So we just have to wait and see. I mean, the news is, is coming out thick and fast out of out of, um, out of Europe and out of um, Syria. Yeah, we haven't even touched on the fallout um, of the conflict in Syria. I mean, and Libya. You have a European-wide refugee crisis. Um, and Well, that's a little bit odd because we know that they had, Turkey had huge refugee camps inside their country. And now that all these refugees, I mean, they could have all easily walked through Turkey into yeah. Europe, but they didn't. Turkey put them on boats and sent them into Greece and, you know, the Greek islands and, and into Italy, Sicily. You know, they've sent them all out there on these little boats, these families. But now Germany's starting to process the, the, uh, these people, and they're only finding that 10% of them are from Syria. Yeah. 10%. And we, also, and we also know that Turkey's opened up a few jails and released a few... Uh, undesirables well they cost less i mean you know it's really hard to justify executing people and uh, you know those people well not just that i mean if you had some real you know your your, your, your jails are full of assholes you know like murderers and rapists yeah. and all the rest of it and you said to them look uh we're gonna send a heap of boats out we know you got family here but if you get on that boat and disappear into europe and you never come back we won't, uh, but if we catch you inside our country again, will they just execute you? Full stop. So if I had that opportunity and I was in a Turkish jail, I'd do a runner too. Yeah. So you got all these criminals coming into Europe. Not, I'm not saying there's genuine refugees, but you got a lot of criminals coming in there as well, yeah. and a lot of people from a lot of other countries. And I'm saying Libya also. You got Libyan coming in mm. there. You've got them. Uh, you got the, uh, the Lebanese. You got all sorts, and they've all been in these camps. These camps are nearly empty now that we're in Turkey on the border. Yeah. And it, no, it's a strange. It was kind of an artificial wave. Yes, the conflict was escalating, but the stream of the refugees didn't double. It didn't triple. It went up, you know, six, seven hundred percent. And uh, this is going to cripple Europe. Well, I don't really think that it's going to cripple Europe. I think Europeans have got the finances and the infrastructure to handle those numbers. But it's, you know, it's it's in Bosnia, Serbia, Croatia that that you know. Uh, first of all, we, you know, in Bosnia, in, in those countries, former Yugoslavian countries, we don't have enough money to house that many refugees. And what's happening is, is this kind of good old regional rivalries. The Serbs are basically setting up buses to take them straight into Hungary or Croatia. The Croatians are <laughs> shipping them over the border to Austria as soon as possible. Yeah, but there's only so, so many. Every, there's only so many you can re rehouse in Germany. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a limit. So the, so that all the South European countries are basically taking them and throwing them over the border into like the rich. What about Saudi countries. Arabia? How come Saudi Arabia hasn't put their hand up for all these refugees? Well, you know, you got you got to ask yourself. Who the hell is going to live there? Emirates. <laughs> Saudi Arabia and Israel, they're very local, fairly rich, mm. and they're getting none of the refugees. Maybe I Israel mean, maybe Israel could put them all in Palestine. You know, <laughs> Israel can kind of argue that most of them are Muslim, and but no, they're meant to be a democracy, a multicultural state, etc., etc. At least they tell us all the time. And they're right there, and mm. aren't they humanitarian? And mm. Saudi Arabia, wait a second, they're Muslim brothers? What about all, like... The, Muslim brothers? Well, you know, it's the country, the home country of the Prophet, in a religion based on peace, based on compassion, and I mean, really, it is based on those things. If you look at, you know, I, when I was in Libya, my impression of Islam was... It, it's a more communal, more egalitarian, definitely, than, say, the Christian ethic. And in a Muslim country, there's much less hungry, starving people. And I'm saying... Given that tendency of the people, I have no idea why their government bars the entry of these refugees, which are Muslims who need help. Mm -hmm. But now the Germans are going to house, I don't know how many, was it like a full million? Um, 
Germany to let, I don't know how many refugees, Germany to accept 800,000 refugees. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think we're taking 12,000 here, uh, Sonny, but we're going to put them straight in the detention centre. <laughs> Are we? <laughs> like That's where it, we're going to house them. It, to be honest, it, the, the... And, you know, Europe, and Germany in particular, um, as austerity mounts, uh, which is, you know, the general economic trend of spending less, less, less on, the pu- on, on public services. You've got a huge former middle class, which is becoming European underclass, which are being pushed towards the right wing. You're going to have these refugees use as scapegoats. And to make it all a lot easier, a lot of them are former fighters and a lot of them are criminals, which, you know, it's much easier to scapegoat bad people than it is to scapegoat good people. Um, I think that the whole refugee crisis is not necessarily... uh, 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 It's beyond just helping people that need help. It's going to be used by right-wing parties in Europe. Oh, um, yeah. To... Got to blame the refugees. They're the easiest ones to blame. They are. And, uh, you know... And that's going to take people's mind off... off, off, uh, on everything that's going on around them anyway. I mean, it's going to take the pressure off the government because they're going to be blaming the, the refugees. You know, it's, 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 all, it's, it's called smoke and mirrors and distraction because that's all it is. I mean, in this country, in Australia, where we're from, yeah, we always use, we use uh, you know, uh, refugees as the, you know, they're the, they're the problem. We get nothing compared to what they get overseas. We get nothing that come. You know, refugee issues have decided elections in this country and uh, you're looking at zero point. Three percent of the population tops over a decade or something. Well, I'll just I'll just let you know. In this country here, we have a we have a two tier refugee system. If you come in on a boat, you're going in a detention center. You come in on a plane, you're doing all right. You don't go to a detention center. You can do whatever you want. So we we uh, we discriminate against boat people and plane people. Yeah. Now we got a lot of people that come in on plane who don't have visas and and all the rest of it, but they don't end up in detention centers. But they never tell you that. No, if you so if on... you're from overseas, you're listening to our program, buy a plane ticket. It's cheaper and easier. And guess what? You could buy a one-way ticket, stay in Australia as long as you want, work, when you want to fly back home, just report yourself to a police station, say, hey, hello, I am Luigi from Italy, I've got no money, <laughs> this is my city, they'll fly you back for free. Yeah, the Australian government will fly you back for free. Um... Unfortunately, that'll be your last visit to Australia, probably. <laughs> and we'll be like, good to know you, mate. But um... oh, our borders are open, man. I'll tell you right now, we got a whole coastline. <laughs> you get past the crocodiles. But you know, it just kind of makes me think. Like, it's one of those issues where, like, we're fucking irrational as a country. We're f- so irrational when it comes to refugees. You've got the right managing to blame, like, oh, if you're not doing well, it's because of these refugees. And the numbers of refugees are too small, even if they were all on, like, Centrelink, every single one of them. Just to let it people wouldn't... know just to let people know out there, me and Sonny are both white, so it doesn't yeah. matter how Australian I might sound, I'm mm. still a refugee in this country. The yeah. only real refugees, the only real people who aren't refugees are the Aboriginals. Yeah. So this whole country's been built on refugees. Well, it has, it has, it has. Now, where I was going with this is that you've got the left, the socialists and that. And, you know, compassionately, I share the same views as they do regarding refugees. I was a refugee myself once upon a time. But they believe, wait, let in as many as humanly possible. Well, fundamentally, if you watch the news a little bit, you'll realize that there's like a hundred million people on planet Earth whose lives are intentionally fucked, either by conflict or economic situations poverty, and, yeah. and, or poverty. Australia can't take 100 million people. Maybe we could take, you know, 100,000 a year or half a million a year. That would be pushing it. But we can't take all the refugees. It's humanly I'll tell you impossible. a country that could take them. China. China's got ghost cities. I mean, they could put 15 million in a ghost city tomorrow if they really wanted to. Well, what I was going to say, well, continuing with Australia, you've got the left going, welcome refugees, we love you all. As much as you may share that sentiment, it's physically not possible. 
you've got the right going. The refugees are the source of all evil. Uh, they're going to come in and put piss, lipstick on your dog. Put lipstick on your dog. Piss on, on put your a skirt flag on it. <laughs> and, and rape your wife and I don't know what else. Oh God, knows. And the reality is, it's not a big issue. But we're going to have elections that are won and lost over the refugee, and nobody's actually looking at like if if you were a fucking politician or somebody managing this country or like some you know is that what they do <laughs> well if they did that just imagine the people in our in parliament and what you know wanted to better the situation in here you would go holy shit syria you know a country with a tradition three times longer than ours here in australia they've got dozens of universities there you know there's got to be a whole lot of fucking doctors engineers builders all kinds of qualified people you know you could send a couple guys over there and build and bring you know people that can only help this country prosper like this notion of no i understand that i understand we always want to you know every country wants to bring in skilled labor but um the biggest problem is is that uh, we got a foreign minister this woman uh, i've got nothing against women but her 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 mental capacity was we should send more airplanes over there to bomb syria to stop the people from coming. That was the thing. It pretty much was Julie like, Bishop or Yeah, like... Julie Bishop. We should bomb them and that will stop them from coming. So we should kill them. The way I see it, we should kill them before they leave. Then they won't come. That's pretty much it. And but, but, but if, look, she's really stylish. The stuff she wears, the colors always match and I don't know what brands she picks, but I mean, I've heard all the women talking when, when, when you know, you're in a bus or in a I can't stand the woman. Then again, I can't stand most politicians. So. Apparently she's really elegant. Apparently she's got really good taste in clothes. Yeah, who cares? I don't care. I mean, does that help you make foreign policy decisions, though? Well, I knew that we had one PM that had to rush back to his house and missed out on a very um, a crucial vote in Parliament because he wanted to be on a on a on a cooking show on our ABC. I'm not going to mention names, but he had to rush back home because he wanted to be on a cooking show because he wanted to look like he was a normal person to the uh, general public. Yeah. Anyway, but that's the sort of politician we have here. They don't think long term; they think short term. If you want to stop, if you want to stop Syrians from from uh, fleeing their country, don't send your planes over there and bomb the shit out of it. Maybe send a few farmers with some seeds and a bit of technology and show them how to grow their own, uh, grow some decent crops and oh, and uh, some equipment to help these people. Because by bombing them, I mean if they it takes it takes a lot of guts for someone to leave their country that's being bombed and go to the country, flee their country and go to the country that's bombing them and try to start a new life. Yeah, that's not exactly... If you think... And this is one thing that I'm extremely annoyed with with a lot of you know people that are hostile towards refugees, generally right-wing people. They really think that like people who have... Again, most of the world is so much more tribal. When you separate people from their family, and I mean extended cousins, brothers, sisters, etc., that's the most traumatic thing they could ever endure. That's right, because that's like, their backup. That's, that, their, that, that's, their, that's their backup. So for people to go from somewhere where that, that's their home, that's where their family is, to somewhere where they don't speak the language, some country that, for all they know, could be hell on earth that is bombing the shit out of them at yeah. the moment... Mm -hmm. Uh, where they have no guarantees, they could be kicked out, they could be put in detention, they could be put in prison, etc. To go through all of that because... You don't want to die. That's pretty much it. They're not doing this to take your fucking job. They're well, doing I'm gonna this... Well, I'm going to quote something from South Park. They're taking our jobs! <laughs> They're doing this because they want to survive. And if you were in their position, you'd do the same thing. Of course thing. you would. The least you could show is a little bit of compassion. Um... But, you know, there we go. We've covered most of the topics. It was a bit of a rant. Chris, yeah, have, we we like to rant. have we forgotten something? There was a bunch of very specific news stories about um, uh, back to Syria. Saudi Arabia is increasing Syrian weapon supplies mm -hmm. while implementing austerity measures at home. Sean Harley sent this. I mean, this is really kind of funny. Like, Why not? That your own people can starve, so some other crazies in a foreign country can try to overtake the government what the fuck is I know we've been laughing a lot but we're, war is shit right it's a shit way to solve anything and this whole idea that the the Americans or the British or the Russians 
won't sit down with this guy or anyone, any 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 nation, and come to a political um, um, answer to the problems they have in that country, where war is the the first option, not the second, is bullshit. I mean, this is bullshit. No, there, it... I mean, and, but you, but the, what what the worst thing is is you got Kerry, which is the uh, second in charge of the U.S. Uh, no, he's not. No, he's foreign. Sorry, foreign uh, minister yeah. in the US. Secretary of State. He won't even talk to Assad. You know, like I won't even talk to him because it's not. They don't want a political solution. They just want to run him out of town. And it, it look, it's scary because you know there's a trend: Libya, Syria, Iraq. You know, you had largely secular governments that kept a stable country where life was good for the vast majority of people. We're not saying that you know these regimes universally respected everybody's rights, everybody's human rights, or had absolute freedom of speech. But for fuck's sakes, the situation that ar- that uh, arose afterwards um, was ten times worse, and it wasn't exactly unpredictable because when overthrowing uh, these Arab secular regimes, invariably the people in the West and their allies in the Gulf supported people who could only be worse on the issues of democracy, human rights, freedom of speech, and all of that. You know, it. I think if you're the average person sitting on, uh, on a couch somewhere in Australia, America, England, if there's anything you can take away from this, is unless you're absolutely informed by intelligence on the ground for years... And I mean, you could almost pull a universal. Your country bombing another Arab country somewhere in the world is a terrible idea. Virtually 100% of the time. If they're ever suggesting to do that, you should be dead set against it. Like foreign intervention. Ah, supporting democratic groups in foreign countries. Generally speaking, uh, this has been newspeak for supporting extremist organization in other countries. As far as foreign policy of all NATO countries, all Western nations, in recent history, in Arab countries and the Middle East, it's for the most part amounted to support for extremists. So the best thing that we could do is tell our governments to stay the fuck out of Arab countries and the Middle East Mm -hmm. and hopefully... Hopefully. Stop selling them weapons. There's a number one. Yeah, and hopefully stop supplying will... weapons and armament, because none of these countries can build. I mean, like Saudi Arabia, they got no industry. They couldn't build jack, right? Yemen, well, Yemen's Yemen's. But I was gonna say, I was gonna say, like, look at what happened organically in Libya. There was a puppet, the 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 puppet king. Um, he got overthrown by the military by a guy called Gaddafi. Oh. Arab people, by default, are going to set up, for the most part, secular regimes. They're going to remain Muslim, which is what their culture is, and good for them. And they're going to generally live peacefully. Mm -hmm. Um, You're going to have these regimes that are going to advantage some tribes over other tribes, but for the most part, when left alone, like that's how the, 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 the Assad family came up, you know, Iranian people voted for Mossadegh, who was, again, another secular leader. Socialist. Socialist. So, you, you know, if left alone, uh, uh, people in Arab countries can do reasonably well for themselves. And if there's anyone that, you know, let, let's let our fucking Western countries support nobody in there. And add civilians and expats and, you know, uh, 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 Muslims and Arabs living overseas are probably going to send money back towards groups and parties that are, you know, pro-fucking yeah, but normal see, human yeah, but see, the, the bit I don't get is if you, want, if you want to get involved in another country, send them technology as in to, to better their life, not, yeah. not friggin' armaments. I mean... Like I said before, send the farmers, send the technology that it takes to grow food, and and you know, and they'll see that, and they'll and they'll go, yeah, that's you know, I, I don't understand this whole bombing the crap out of some country to get what you want out of it. I mean, pretty much, you know, everywhere America's gone, uh, they've left a trail of destruction. It's just mayhem. 
I mean, everywhere they've gone, it's just mayhem. And and I see America setting up bases. They've set one up here in Australia. They've set them up in the right round China. They've set them up all round uh, Russia. I don't see Russia setting up bases anywhere. I see one in Syria now. I don't see I don't see China setting up bases all over the world. So, you know, you've got to ask the question. You know, when when we talk about in this country, if you ask anyone over the age of forty, you know, who's good? You know, Americans are good. They're the goodies. Everyone else is bad. And even George Bush said. You're either with us, or you're not, with, or you're against oh, with, us. You're with a terrorist. Yeah, that's right. You're with a terrorist. So, the so alternative, you're either... I mean, it's, it's it's a really kind of false alternative. Well, you are a terrorist if you're not with them. Yeah, and look, the reality is, you live in a world where um, you have had since Second World War an American Empire. Um, for the most part, during the Cold War, what happened was that you had these two forces that largely didn't didn't intervene in each other's affairs. U.S. controlled approximately two thirds of the world, Russia approximately one third. Um, they never really had any conflict with each other, and you know it was a mostly American world. Since the fall of of, of Russia, the world's become even more dominated by well, one superpower. The, the military industrial complex was making less... a lot of money when the Cold War was on. Yeah. And and then when they when that when that fell, they could see their profits because America remember their profits the profits from the military industrial complex in the U.S. would have plummeted after the Cold War, mm. and 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 now every way they go you know it's more guns more weapons more jets. But I was going to say think about it this way you know when you, you you know it was almost the Cold War was a more peaceful time in the world because you had these two superpowers sort of. A posturing against each other they knew that if we had a conflict if we actually if we actually had a conflict oh my god comments 16 comments socialism too bad mike said <laughs> oh my god all right many minutes ago um i don't know which way to scroll this thing okay a few seconds ago beautiful all right i find it Mike B. Americans are partial socialistic capitalistic. They're far f from full democracy and America just wants to take over. One world government is going to happen. Yeah. Well, uh, no, I, th I think, no, I think you're right. I think uh, America, America is not democracy. I mean, you haven't got democracy there because the politicians aren't doing what the people want. They're practically, they're practically ignoring like in our government, we they they ignore the the, the population because they they are only interested in one thing, and that's big business and monopolies. Monopolies run rife in these countries, so called. And I mean, there is this, there is something to be said about this kind of conspiratorial notion that you know has been peddled by right wing in America. The um, you know Alex Jones types, the Birch. Was it the Birch Society? The New World Order. Look, the reality is that you have... Now with the TPP, uh, the European Union, the International Trade Organi World Trade Organization, what you have is a trend of corporations um, surpassing in power states. Yep. And through the na through the giant capitalistic system, you also have the notion that with you know stock market, hedge funds, commodities markets, it is more profitable to have information to know the future price of the oil than it is to even dig for oil and have oil because you can bet on the future price. Yep. And this is why um, what you have is in a way. A one world government because the people who are real power players are you know a small group of and it's just like David Rothkopf has his book something like the super class about the 6,000 richest people in planet earth um, they're no more bound by borders you have a small pool of people owning majority shares in the fortune 500 corporations which profit from global conflict, which profit from U.S. control of these resources, which profit from Saudi Arabian oil, and which profit from globalization and the fact that the factories are now moving, you know, from the West to China. 
So you've basically got a very small group of people. Well, that's, using the, but that's what the TPP is. It's playing. It's playing. It's playing. Playing the workers of Australia and the workers of the US off against the Chinese workers, South Korean workers. Mm. We're all being played off one another. And I mean the fact that nations and TPP, nations can sue governments for loss of profits. That's right. Meaning that, like, if your cars loot a lot, and I put regulation that means that you need to put catalytic converters or whatever the fuck on your cars, which makes you lose money on your cars, yeah, fuel. then the country that protected its citizens from getting poisoned could get sued by the corporation. Yeah, but they reckon now what's going to happen is, let's say I, I want to start up a company in the Great Barrier Reef, and I want to, I want to, uh, I want to uh, pump oil out of the Great Barrier Reef, and I'm yeah. just going to any tailings, any leftover chemicals, I just punch it. Just let it flow out onto the reef and yeah. kill whatever. Now, I could set up a business and, and, and in my, in my uh, business activity statement of how I'm going to run this business and what I'm going to do, and as soon as I get the EPA from Australia to come in and say, oh, you can't do that, you'll kill the barrier reef, blah, 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 you go, you're interfering with my profits. So I put all this money mm. up to fight in court. I'm not even actually going to do the business. Because I'm going to sue the Australian government for future profits of a company that I was never going to start up in the first place. And you know what? It doesn't get fought out in an Australian court. It gets fought out in an international, international tribunal, tribunal, which is a court, which is yeah. the peers of, mm. of uh, company peers. I mean, it's just disgusting. So just, just to kind of comment on this notion of New World Order, like I have read a ton of literature. Um, How can you? A ton it's, of top it's, top, it's top secret. Yeah. And I really don't think that any kind of subsection of the Masons or the Skull and Bone Society, as powerful as those people are, those are just groups that consolidate information, has any kind of solid 500-year consistent plan for controlling the world. No. The reality is um, people with power want more power. and It's beyond money. They... Uh, 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 associate with each other loosely because they have common interest. Ooh, if you had a billion dollars, guess what you'd want? You would want really free movement of capital. You'd be able, you would want to be able to move your money from one country to another. You would want to invest your money freely in any country, in any corporation. You would want really low corporate taxes, lots of tax loopholes. Mm -hmm. You'd want the ability to sue governments. So guess what? All of these changes that we're witnessing are the equivalent of the billionaires of this world forming a union the same way a bunch of miners would form a union and going, what are our interests and let's pursue our interests. Mm -hmm. And they are successfully pursuing their interests. Mm -hmm. And their interest is to acquire more power mm -hmm. and maintain a status quo where it is okay for one person such as them to have a million times more resources than the average person. But now, I don't think this is some kind of long-range, coherent plan which ends with our extinction. But in a way, a, a, a lot of the predictions of the doomsayers in the system are going to come true. You're going to have more surveillance of individuals. Um, you're going to have more under quotation marks scientific management, which means that companies like Google and everything acquire as much data about us to predict. And they can run, they can run monopolies. They don't have to worry about that. Patents and, and but, more, yeah, more control over means to generate wealth. The socialists would call means of uh, of production. So yes, a more dystopian world. I don't know. Maybe Mike has got some more comments. No, a few seconds ago, we can always look at the movie They Live. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Ratty Roddy Piper. Excellent. But you know what? The other thing too is now that we've signed this Trade Pacific Partnership here in Australia, mm. why isn't this? Uh, I'm a small business, right? So why can't I see in the Herald Sun or in my uh, on the news? No, I need it in written form. It has to be in written form. So in the in the local paper or or whatever, the Trade Pacific Partnership in detail. What what, what can I get a booklet from the government in detail? Everything that it everything that it, that we've signed, all this, this treaty and these trade agreements, because me being a small business now, I want to know how I can trade around the world and dodge tax and, and copyright law, and is that going to affect my business? So I can understand that it was all top secret before, and no one could see it. 
mind you, that's yeah. totally illegal for any government to sign any doc or any trade or treaty with any other country unless it goes through our parliament. And obviously our parliament has to vote on it, but somehow we've got around this. So what I want to know is now I'm, a, I'm running a business, so I need to know what's in that package. What business? Tell me what businesses here in Australia that have the all that information on the TPP. It should be released now, shouldn't it? I mean, it? why is it still top secret? Look, it is top secret because first of all, if you're going to ask yourself who's going to get screwed by this, yeah, but wait a minute, people, I need to know if, as part of my business. No, you don't. Well, I, I run a business. No. I'm a I'm a I'm a manager. From the, point, of a, from the point of view, from the point of view of say the American government, the Australian government, yeah. the New Zealand government, well, this is a new trade agreement. The Canadian government. What they, what they want, first of all, who gets them into office? Major corporations. So they want to benefit. Well, number one beneficiaries are going to be. No, I understand that, but surely sh we should know what's in this agreement now that it's been signed, so we can use it to our advantage. Because isn't it an advantage of all businesses of Australia to 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 use this trade, this new trade agreement? That is a great point. The Where point is, it? is though, they can't release the information because it would constitute a riot. One thing I'd say, it from the released leaked documents, um, they certainly crush your civil rights. They're going to nice. spy on your internet traffic. Excellent. They're going to, uh, uh, um, you know, the notion that you go to trial when you have a conflict with somebody like a corporation. Fantastic. Instead of going, you know, to a jury of your own peers or some magistrate or some fucking person or body that's elected by people around you that has some semblance of democracy, maybe, mm -hmm. you're going to these international tribunals which are created literally by the people. By companies. By companies who are going to get, who are going to have cases in those tribunals, which is complete injustice. So you'd have a, a, an outrage on the basis of people in the West that are interested in civil rights. You'd have an, it'd be outrageously, you know, if nations are going to get fucked by it, I am willing to bet my bottom dollar that small nations in Asia that are going into pacts with Australia, United States, Canada, New Zealand are going to get the, the worst end of the deal. So basically, it, you know, the, the, the big cats are going to get rich of it. And by big cats, I mean the corporations. And they're going to mess with our civil rights and liberties. I'm not sure that it's going to be economically bad for Australia, but I'm pretty fucking sure that it's I think going we're gonna to... Get our, I think we're going to get sued. There's no doubt about it. I'm pretty sure that, you know, if you're the average person who wants to have a business that may potentially compete with big, with big corporations... It's bad for you. So it's bad for the, you know, small business entrepreneurial class. I'm pretty sure if you like your rights and privacy, it's terrible for you. And so um, I really, in fact, I think if there hasn't been an outrage about this, it, it just shows you that um, people are asleep. Yeah. Like, wake okay. up. <laughs> the. You know, the fact that it's not covered by the mainstream press seems to be enough. It seems to be enough to keep the average Australian person's attention from what's important. Well, you don't have to worry about it because the football's finished and the cricket's starting. So you don't have to worry about it, mate. Back to the back to the sport. Back to the distraction. Okay, we got another comment. Well, not everything. They just hide certain things well. People go around things to evade having to let us, everyone, know what's going on on fully because then people may find out, like, oh, we don't like this... What? Or that from it, and want to revolt against the agreement. So Mike B, I think, was commenting about um, what we were saying on the topic of TPP. Oh, okay. But yes, uh, look, drop us a comment if you're aware of any protest going on about TPP. Chris and I would probably like we'll to research attend. it. We'll come back and uh, hit it, um, and we would would promote it. I really think that there needs to be a little bit more inquiry, a little bit more outrage, and a little bit more information, truth, facts, drafts, and final well, agreements about the TPP. Because I, I also think no, I also think if you're an Australian and you like ringing up radio stations like myself, uh, I think. You should be ringing up all the major radio stations here in Australia and asking them, where is the report or the copy of this trade agreement so we can read it and use it to our benefit as a business? Yep. That's it. I mean... Now that we've signed it, we need to know what it is so we can use it to our benefit. Chris Chris basically wants to know how to register his uh, plumbing company in a tax haven. <laughs> no, I don't. 
So I think, you know, <laughs> you'll, you'll register up in the Seychelles or something. Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a, yeah, I've just got a, I've just, I've just bought a new apartment just in New York, Vatican City, actually. Nice tax haven there. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's very nice. But yeah, it's been really good to get some comments this time around. I think we're going to start wrapping up. We'll be back next Sunday, 4.30 again. This is going to be our standard time. Yes, you should ring in and you should send comments so we can talk about all sorts of things. But the TPP is a very interesting topic and it's it's, it's a big topic to cover because we have very little information about it. We keep hearing what, what's good about it. We haven't heard any bad things about it, but we know that this big fight over in Hong Kong right now with um, with one of the major tobacco companies about plain paper packaging, that's all going to disappear now because now we've signed the TPP. We're restricting their trade. So you will see that get dropped like a hot banana and they will come back into the country and you'll start seeing, you know, smoking's good for you at uh, pictures of beaches and people having fun. They'll, and... they'll all be back on the smoking packages soon. Like, you won't be able to discriminate when it comes to, say, advertising, which will be funny. Like, imagine you're a school and you wouldn't mind a book publisher advertise their latest VCE revision thing on your school billboards. All mm -hmm. of a sudden, it's going to be okay to advertise... Um, kids and smoking? Yeah. Restriction yeah. of trade. My 12-year-old should be smoking cigarettes right now. That's it. Peace you and know? happiness. Coca-Cola. Remember those Sprite. old ads? Remember those old ads we used to dig up in the fifties where smoking was actually good for you? Good for tooth decay, you know, stop tooth decay and all the rest yeah. of it. You gotta you gotta wonder though, Australia's got like fantastic regulations against the drug companies. They can't buy off doctors half as much as USA. They can't put ads on Oh, TV. that's in the TPP, mate. You can do that now. You're serious. <laughs> I I, I hey. I doctors like... doctors have to go on a um you know, when they get retrained, right? So mm. these pharmaceutical companies will get them retrained over in Hawaii. You know, there's new drugs and new medical procedures and all the rest of it. So they fly over there one day at the conference and two weeks with their kids on the beach. If that's not buying off a doctor, I don't know what is. Look, that's the standard in America. I happen to know a lot about the way it is in Australia because my um, brother-in-law happens to be director of marketing for one major pharmaceutical in the country. And, like, learning... What's your, what's your last name, Sonny? And learning, uh, learning about the regulations that are on them, like actually gave me a warm glow in the heart, as much as it annoys him. Um, but yeah, I'm wondering, I really am. If anyone knows, drop us a line. Um, whether that's about to go with the TPP, because just predicting with the trends of the other things we've heard, probably is. Yeah, but I find something really interesting too. If this trade agreement has been brought in and it's all good and great and then we find out in 12 months that it's nothing but bad luck for all of us because we're mm. losing our jobs there i mean well, i've even heard that they're going to fly in a building company in from china all chinese they're going to fly in live in a hotel in the city build a building with all chinese steel chinese labor chinese it's closed shop so no australians will be able to no unions will be able to go in there chinese will build a building then they'll all get back in the plane they'll fly back to china if this is true in 12 months time or, or two years' time, whenever we come up for elections again, we should be able to rip this treaty up. You should be able to go to elections and say, we're going to rip this treaty up. Because if you can write a treaty, you can certainly rip it up. Yeah. So I'll be very curious to see what happens. But then, back to the uh, Bush thing. You're either with us, or you're Al-Qaeda. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that'll be it. Watch out. We started with the uh, war in Syria, continued to the European refugee crisis, and ended up with a TPP. And I would say, out of all of those issues, the one that affects your lives in Australia, in Melbourne, is the TPP. We invite you to start Googling it, look it up, see if there's anything we can do to organize against it. If you've ever called a radio, call it. If you've ever visited your local MP, ask him. Ask him. He'll have no idea. <laughs> Unless you're a corporation, then he might have some idea. <laughs> okay. On that note, we love you all. Oh, Sean, you just got you got the last comment in a few seconds ago. That's fantastic. You should have jumped in earlier. All right. All right. Ciao. Ciao. Amazing. There was no such thing as poverty. Um, you know, there was a, 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 a again. It was a dictatorship. This, sound, this sounds like all propaganda and lies. Because I heard Gaddafi was a pretty, uh, pretty, a real bastard. According to uh, mainstream media. Well, look. Uh, Didn't they give away free bread in an apartment for young people? Isn't that yeah, what they, they there? look, education was free, scholarship overseas were free, infrastructure was amazing, you'd get interest free loans upon marriage. Interest free? Well, that's capitalism gone backwards. Yeah, well. <laughs>
<laughs> so I'm sure he was pretty bad to a very narrow list of people he considered enemies. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he was okay with beheading them. <laughs> But, I mean, if you're leading a country, and you're bad to where it's 10,000 people, and you're good to four and a half million, you know, you got to take that into context. Mm-hmm. Now, we're getting, we're getting some likes and comments. Oh, how lovely. Um, but going back to Libya. So I moved out of Libya in a while. Uh, Did you take your interest-free loan with you? (laughs) I was a foreigner. Honestly, when I moved out of Libya, if somebody's told me you can have a Libyan passport or the American or the Australian or the German or the Swiss, Mm. I would have taken the Libyan one. It came with more freebies. To be a citizen of Libya came with more freebies than any country I was aware of. So then America bombed Libya. So then where'd you go? Did you go to Baghdad after that? Was that No, I was in Australia when America bombed Libya. And but my mom was in Libya. My dad was in Germany. At, like my dad was in Libya when they bombed Bosnia he was in Germany when they bombed Libya so my dad somehow always escapes from all these wars and yeah, my mom very good my mom <laughs> always gets stuck in the bombed country oh well that's probably what I do with my missus <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even mention that I was in Iraq before they bombed Iraq oh there you go there you go nonetheless Beautiful. you're picking the right countries nonetheless you know it was I had friends that were there, guys that I went to high school with, and initially they were telling me, Oi, Sonny, you know, we've got fucking crazies uh, from e- Egypt, like they're crazy Muslim extremists, the worst of the worst coming here trying to kill us. Next thing they're going, we are for the rebels, because like they were genuinely afraid that these people are going to take over and start executing whoever said some bad things on Facebook, and it was, uh... and my mom got out of the airport, but I'm more or less... Uh, uh, realized that the the story that was being told about Gaddafi was completely false. Of course. The story that was being told about the opposition was completely false. And the way that Libya went down, the way that the Gaddafi government regime, if you want to use that term, it's not exactly inaccurate for Libya. Mm. The way the regime went down was that um, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Emirates, uh, with, of course, the backing of United States and NATO, found the craziest elements within Libya, and but mostly foreign fighters within Egypt and mm-hmm. um, other Arab countries. Well, there was a lot of Chechens over there too, wasn't there? Yeah. Basically, any Muslim that's generally against secular governments, which mm-hmm. Libya was one... There's a few down there from Indonesia too. They don't like uh, secular yeah. governments. They wanted, you know, the Sharia law, the... I don't know. The, 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 and they all got mobilized to overthrow Gaddafi. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, the state of Libya is ten times worse. Mm-hmm. And these people, after Gaddafi was overthrown, had to go somewhere. You know, once you start assembling... Well, they were pretty much... We we found out that they were pretty much put on a transporter plane, American, and flown straight over to uh, Syria. Yep. And this is kind of where the story um, continues. Because I was sort of tuned into what's going on in Libya. Next thing you know, the next regime dictator, again, democratically elected... To a large extent, the most legitimate person to rule uh, uh, the Syria at the moment. Mm-hmm. It's not like there is a popular democratic movement behind one specific party or a group of people that you know a majority of people in Syria support. Like Assad has got more legitimacy to govern that country than anybody else, and he has a track record of uh, you know a largely peaceful, secular, multi-ethnic, multicultural. Multi-religious. There's plenty of Christians well, in Syria you, that were doing well. Well, if, quite you, well, thank if you, you wanted to talk about a country that beheads people and chops people's hands off and all that, I don't think you could look any further than uh, Saudi Arabia. I mean, if you want to, if you want to talk about dictators and uh, people that have no human rights, well, uh, and, and things, and you know, we in Australia, our leaders, the US leaders, they backed the bid to get. Saudi Arabia to chair the UN Human Rights Council. I know, it's just disgusting. I mean, that's it's just so backward, it's not funny. <laughs> it's ridiculous. These people don't even know what human rights are, but they just put their hand up for it. That's like asking Israel to look through the human rights in Palestine. But I mean, you know, like, you got to think, though. Uh, I mean, if when somebody brings up the idea, right, it, it's like, hey, uh, we got to... I have an idea, Chris. We're doing the Manhattan Project for Solar Cells 
and we want a visionary, visionary leader, and, and George Bush. What do you reckon? George Bush? Oh, well, he's, a, he's a real smarty, that one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's like, it's so ridiculous, you couldn't imagine I it. Watched like... him, I watched him when the towers come down reading a book to school kids, and he had the, it was, uh, uh, I don't know, Jenny, something to do with Jenny and the goat. You know, it was like a two-year-old children's book, and he actually had it upside down. So, you know, he's really he's so on, fucking smart. He he's on the ball. He can, read, he can read upside down. <laughs> Children's <laughs> book. It's amazing. I'm fucking amazing. <laughs> anyway, anyway. But I mean, no, it, it, it's, it's kind of what, what you're looking at is a surreal thing. And I wanted to, like, just show some of the reporting. So, um, what's been evident from the reports on the ground in Syria? What's been evident from the fact that there was hundreds of millions of dollars of funding going to Syrian rebels, and there was no distinction between Syrian rebels and Al-Qaeda, it's been... Uh, um, the fact that these crazies were being trained in Turkey, were making their way through Turkey uh, uh, into... Uh, so, Chris... Well, that was the fucking news, man. That was the <laughs> what fucking can I say? News. We'll just expand on all those topics he just touched on there, I reckon. <laughs> Yeah, look, um, may I just sort of like give you a, a pre-shadowing? Neither of us is a geopolitical expert or a former ambassador to any nation, nor have we written books on the subject or anything like that, but it, we're both, you know, from a, a unique perspective in Melbourne following these topics, and we would rant, be ranting about this in person over coffee, and since the Zeitgeist Melbourne show needs to be done, we figured... Let's you know, not, let's just drink coffee and rant about it on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> And, I mean, for me, personally, where, you know, a lot of what's going down in Syria comes from, and um, it comes from the event. I lived in Libya for nine years, uh, between 2002 and 1993. Uh, basically, there was a war in Bosnia, which was initiated by America, as we later found America! out. America! <laughs> in the standard American way, um... Eventually, they bombed people, mm -hmm. and they bombed the bad people. But initially, they just gave money to every extremist. They were like, you guys out here, we don't really like your country, so we're going to find nutters, and whoever is the nuttiest is going to get the weapons. And, you know, Muslim extremists, Serbian extremists, Croat extremists, people that have committed genocide during Second World War and First World War all got American funding and weapon in this quest for democracy because the socialist system that we had prior to that oh you can't have socialism we can't have that no that that was the true terrorists yeah that's right socialism is a terrorist so somehow the guys that fought off the nazis in the second world war and established the government that was generally popular they were the terrorists but the people that fought with the nazis now they were the freedom nonetheless so the reasoning of how i ended up in libya was thanks to U.S. endowment for democracy and U.S. foreign policy. That's how Fantastic. I ended up in Libya. And then, uh, then they bombed Libya, certainly. So then what happened? So it was Libya was a really nice country. It was really nice. Uh, the infrastructure was amazing. Hello, everyone. Sunny here. Chris. Hey, is how you going? With me, and this is episode four of Zeitgeist Melbourne Radio. Now, the way things work with Spreaker is uh, it we have to start the radio show in order to be able to share it. So. While we're getting all that set up, we want you to listen to some of the topics we'll be talking about in the news as told in this satirical clip. You're going to love it. Just said, why don't you, for once in your life, just do the fucking news? All right. No, no, no. No. I'm going to do... No, I'm going to do the fucking news. No. Here is the fucking news. Ex-commercial TV PR man, old Etonian and occasional big fucker David Cameron would like to bomb Syria. Unfortunately, Russia's got there first and America's been doing it. He wants to bomb Syria to stop the flow of refugees fleeing all the bombs. He's also hoping it will stop the increased influence of Islamic extremism. Bombing Syria would, of course, destroy the one remaining multicultural society in the region, leaving it open to the increased influence of Islamic extremism. To bomb Syria, therefore, is clearly mental. In other news, no, 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 I'm doing, no, I'm doing the news. I'm doing the fucking news. In other news, in other news, Muslims are bad, China's bad, but not as bad as it used to be, and Russia is always bad. Nuclear weapons are good, and to suggest not using nuclear weapons is bad. Onto the economy, debt is good. Corrupt banks are bad, but not bad enough for us to do anything about them, and poverty in the UK is a figment of your imagination. Onto housing, Jeremy Corbyn's plans to build affordable housing and create social housing for the poorest people in our society is a terrible idea. That's according to multi-millionaire, property magnet, and all-round shitpot Sir Alan Sugar. 
environmental news, there's nothing to worry about. So please carry on consuming at your usual rate. And finally tonight, entertainment. Matt Damon's intelligent and articulate observations about sexuality in Hollywood means that he is definitely a homophobic twat. My name is Jonathan Pye, and that was the fucking news! Oh, there we are.